Uh, I guess I'm the moderator, but you know, I think we are a very small group, so it can be like a free-flowing discussion here. I don't need to moderate anything. I just want to introduce Clayton, though. So Clayton Clark is, has served as a general manager of Green Mountain Trust since January. Since January. Oh my God, yes. 2023. I, I know everything by now. Oh yeah, you know. I'm pretty sure. I am pretty sure. And prior to that, he served as a mission support officer in the United States Air Force. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what that means. I flew a desk. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, that's great. Managed a variety of human service programs for the state of Vermont and led a long-term care facility during the pandemic. Wow. Yes. Amazing. Yes. Uh, he has a bachelor's degree in English from SUNY uh, Binghamton. Binghamton. Yes. yes. And a master's degree in government from Harvard University. So welcome, Clayton. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Uh, I'm Eleni Churchill. I'm mm -hmm. with the Chilean County Regional Planning Commission. Thank you, Eleni. And okay. so thank you. Please take it off. And thank you everyone for coming today. And, uh, and so we only have 30 minutes. Um, and, uh, and what I'm trying to do in that 30 minutes is going to give you like a little bit of an idea of what the new fare system is going to look like. Um, and then talking about you know, how we came to, uh, came to there. And so uh, starting right off, um, these are the four topics. I'm um, going to do the history as briefly as possible. Um, I'm emphasizing that uh, this is impacting urban because uh, GMT's rural routes will continue to be uh, fare free. And, uh, and then just how we got from the old to new. And so we stopped collecting fare. I got to like stop. I'm getting in front of that and look my eyes. We stopped collecting fares in March of 2020. No. Can anyone guess why we stopped collecting fares? No. <laughs> so, so on March of 2020, um, we knew that we needed to still operate our service. Um, but it was the beginning of the, uh, the COVID pandemic. And um, uh, we said, you know what? For the time being, let's um, have folks come in through the back door of uh, the bus, because all of our urban buses have a, a rear door. And that way, they don't have to pass the driver, and and so that will reduce, you know, the, the physical distance, or actually uh, increase the physical distance and reduce contact. And I can tell you that when we started this, you know, there was no idea that it would go. It was probably, hey, we'll do this for a few weeks, you know, because back then it was you know, nobody really knew how things were going to go. And so uh, we continued this. Um, until the present day. And what ended up happening is that uh, we really liked it. We liked the fact that uh, our service was faster. We didn't have to have people you know, stop by and interact with the driver uh, when they were getting on. Routes went faster. And it ended that conflict that happens uh, with uh, the driver sometimes when somebody comes on board. And uh, maybe they didn't have exact change because at that time we were cash only. And to say they only had a five dollar bill and it was a dollar fifty fare, and you know we we can't provide uh, can't provide change. And so it just getting rid of that friction point was wonderful. And uh, um, and so thinking, I started a little bit on this. So thinking about the old systems. It was, when you got on board the bus, there was only one uh, way that you could pay, which was with cash, unless you had previously gone to the transit center and purchased either a monthly pass or a, uh, a 10 ride ticket. And so that required people to go and spend money in advance. And you could use a credit card at the transit center to purchase those things, but you could, if, if you had no cash and no pass, you were out of luck. Um, if you need to get on the bus. Uh, we also had uh, three different fares because uh, we had the urban local, uh, which is the, the buses that run uh, around the city and into Essex and um, to Shelburne, uh, Williston, and those were $1.50. Then we had commuter runs, uh, which were from Jeff Jeffersonville, from Milton, um, those were two dollars, 
And then our link runs uh, from Montpelier, uh, from St. Albans, those were $4. And then each of them had different monthly pass costs. So if you wanted an unlimited monthly pass for around town, it was $40. But if you wanted an unlimited pass for the link, it was $150 because it was a more expensive service. And it was $75 uh, for the commuter pass. And so all of this was stuff that people had to keep in their mind. They kind of had to pre-plan you know, their, their passes and go and purchase those. Um, and so it required a lot of additional thinking you know, on, on the part of, uh, of the riders. And, uh, oh, <laughs> I guess I should hit that. So this is uh, uh, what we just talked about. And, um, and one of the things I want to point out is that we have uh, we're required to have a discount program. And uh, the discount program is that if you're under 18, over 60, uh, or self-identified disabled, then your fares uh, would be half. And so all of these products uh, would be half the price. Um, one of the things that um, I do let folks know is that um, our practice historically, and, and we're going to continue this, is that we don't have a bureaucratic process uh, for, you know, when somebody says they're disabled. And so for this at least, somebody says, hey, I have a disability, we take their word for it, and uh, then they get the reduced fare rate. They don't have to provide documentation uh, or anything. So Clayton, you don't have discounts for um, like um, income level. We do not. Okay. We do not. So we, okay. Yeah. That, I would just say that that's major. I do hear you know a lot of public meetings. People cannot even afford their one fifty. Yes. So and let so alone are, the. And contract. these are the old rates. Yeah. And so yeah. we'll talk about the the new rates, which in some cases are lower. Lo yeah. And. Uh, but some uh, cases higher. In some cases, higher. Okay. And the. Um, so why don't you? Why don't we? Yes. Why don't you have like a discount fare for income? I, the reason why is because that would require an administrative uh, function so at GMT program. that we don't have. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I will tell you that about half of our riders end up with the discount rate. Uh, so. Uh, it definitely is. It's not just a small uh, percentage. And so here's what we're thinking about. Uh, uh, I mentioned before that this is just for urban um, to make sure that I don't want anyone to go back home to Montpelier and say, hey, the, the fares are coming back, you know, because they're not coming back to Montpelier unless you're getting on that link. And so we're returning fares um, here in the local uh, service and the commuter and in the, um, uh, the links. Uh, one of the things that I do want to point out is that there is a commuter that we share with Tri-Valley Transit, and so that's called the 116 commuter, which as you can guess goes up one, 116. And because they're an entirely rural system, and the rural system will be staying fare free, um, what we didn't want to do is have a route that depending on which bus you got, there would be a fare or no fare. And so, so that will stay uh, fare free. So what we proposed, proposed is that we wanted to simplify um, our uh, plan so that there was just one fare. And it didn't matter what uh, you were uh, using. It would be $2. And, um, and the important thing is, is that we're getting away from pre-purchased passes to having a cap. And so the way the cap works is that we'll have both a daily cap and a monthly cap. And so the daily cap will be $4. So essentially, nobody, who, um, uh, nobody will have to pay more than $4 uh, a day. So if they go on and ride 10 rides, um, what will happen is the first two rides, uh, and we'll get into the mechanics in a moment, uh, they'll either swipe their phone, swipe a smart uh, card, uh, they could, um, uh, those, most of the folks will use a smart, bar, a smart phone or smart card, 
uh, but they will have the ability to pay with uh, cash and credit still. And so the, the purse will come. We think about 90% of our folks will use their smartphone because they just have to download the app and it take them two seconds to, uh, to create it and so be linked to their payments that they already have on their phone. Uh, so that'll be easy. They'll swipe it once, they'll get charged $2. They'll swipe it again, they'll get charged $2. And then the rest of the day, when they get on board, they'll still swipe it. The driver will see, hey, this person is you know, paid, and then they'll go sit down, but they don't get charged. And uh, so the fare cap for the day will be $4. And for the uh, month, it'll be 50 Now, when we had originally put out our fare proposal, uh, Earlier this summer, we uh, had a fair uh, a cap of 40, and uh, we uh, had some cost estimates uh, that were run on that. And because uh, we have a target, uh, the legislature said, you know what, we want to make sure that uh, because we know that there is this pressure to limit the impact on folks um, with the return to fares, that there will be this pressure to have prices be low, but the reality is, is that we do need that income. And so they sent a 10% target uh, for us as a minimum. And so what we found out was is that $40, we were going to be a couple hundred thousand dollars short uh, on that uh, target. So the $50 um, will get us right at that 10%. Um, and, um, and just for historical purposes, um, in late 2019, we reduced the pass, uh, the monthly pass, from $50 to $40 because we wanted to in increase the number of folks uh, that were buying monthly passes. And uh, so the $50 pass, uh, or the $50 monthly pass, was the price from 2005 to 2019. And so that's why we can, when we say that we're returning to fares, and we say that we're actually we're increasing the local fares, which let's be honest, the majority of folks are using the, the local service, so a majority of folks will see a price increase. But their costs will be capped to what the price of a monthly pass was in 2005. So almost 20 years ago, you could get all the service that you wanted just local for $50. And now in 2023, you're going to get all of the local commuter and link routes for the same for the same price. And the new tech is what is driving this, and this is kind of where I wanted to you know spend the discussion here. But one of the nice things about small groups is that if you're not interested in, in sort of like the philosophical um, you know uh, things that went into the thinking behind this, we can you know move into different. Um, you know, when we started thinking about our fares, what did we do? As organizations, um, you know, organizations evolve over time organically, and they tend to um, add layers. And so what you started with, you know, gets layers added, layers added, layers added, and then 20 years, you know, down the road, you have something that, you know, is probably different than... It started, and people wonder, gee, why did it ever, you know, you know come out this way? And um, and what the technology allowed us to do, because we were there, we were talking about how we're going to, you know, uh, return to fares, and we naturally thought of our previous practices, and we just thought that, man, this is going to be too difficult. It's going to be too difficult for our riders. It's going to be too difficult for us to manage. You know, like we have, you know, having the three different. Uh, you know, fare structures and how are we going to do that with a single card. And the thing is, is that we realized our technology, by having the new tech, this is an opportunity to reset. So let's just throw out the entire, you know, way that we used to operate and, and build from the ground up. And, and build from the ground up with taking advantage of the tech. You know, how would we build this with this tech if we were starting from scratch? And, uh, and that's how we came uh, with this. And so as we heard, it's going to be different because people, when they come on board, um, uh, you know, when they come on board, they're going to have many different ways to pay. Uh, where in the past, they really just have the one. Um, and 
What I think is critical, and there's been some recent uh, study on the fare capping and how that is a much more equitable uh, practice than passes, is that nobody is going to have to, thinking of the barriers, nobody is going to have to pay an upfront cost. And so uh, it's like, hey, I want the best price available, but my circumstances mean that I don't have $40 in my pocket or $50 in my pocket you know, to purchase that. So I'm going to end up spending more t money over time because I'm poor. You know, we wanted to uh, avoid that. And so here, come in, we're going to help you set up an account. If you have a smartphone, it's going to live right on your smartphone. You don't need to keep track of anything else. If you have the smart card, um, it'll be on that smart card. If you lose that smart card, you don't lose the value there because we'll just deactivate that card and give you a new one. We're not planning on um, charging for these cards. We know that that may be a little naive to begin with because the nice fancy smart cards are $4 a piece. Um, if we do run into a situation where um, we're having people routinely, repeatedly lose their smart cards, we have a cheaper Tyvek card that we can switch to to provide them. Um, our plan is not to charge for those. Um, again, we're going to let, this, let the, the usage sort of drive um, you know, our, our future actions there, if we find that we have a lot of folks who are like losing their car daily, you know, then we may have to come up with a, with a new system. And, uh, um, and really the, the key is, is that before, you know, we would, we would give out a 30-day a, a pass or a 10-ride pass, and we'd have no idea how that would be used. And now, because it's gonna be tied to a specific user, um, we're going to have much more granularity so that we're going to know <coughs> stop specific. Hey, at this stop here, we bring on board 130 people a day and 60% of them are discount riders, you know, 40% uh, are full, full, and then we'll have a better idea of who's using our system and where. Okay, question. Quick question. For the fair capping, do they have to use the smart card or somebody's paying? with a credit debit card not going to be able to take advantage of that fair cap. So what will happen is that um, with the smart card, uh, people who are entirely cash-based mm -hmm. will be able to get the price protections. They will have the inconvenience, however, uh, to start of having to come to one of our transit centers or to our headquarters. And, uh, and what they'll do is, is that they'll just hand us the cash. We'll then add that uh, onto their uh, account. So you can have somebody that has no credit card, no debit card, and they'll get the full benefit of the price protections. Um, there was a question before we started. We recognize that some of our, you know, some of our users don't want their name, you know, in anything, and uh, and so for those folks, we're also going to be working uh, to essentially, you know, hey, we don't need you to have your full name and address. Um, but we need to have some kind of identifier so that when you lose your pass, or if you lose your pass in the future, you don't lose you know, value on your card. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, you know, for those few folks who really just don't want their name in the system, don't want their information in there, we're going to be able to do that for them too. Um, so just to clarify that question though, is I think he was also asking that if I just use my credit card and oh. use that same card all day long, it will give me the price protection. I don't think that will. Really? Yeah. But, and so I think that um, the, and keep in mind that they will be on site with us training us on their system next month. Right. And uh, but my understanding of the system is that it's not smart enough to know that if Bobby has a smart account, and Bobby then uses his credit card that's not, you know, on that account. I don't think it will match it up. But our assumption is is that Bobby's going to be using his smartphone or a smart card. Uh, otherwise, I've seen transit systems elsewhere which are intelligent enough that as long as you use the same card that yeah. day, then they don't charge you anything more than a certain amount. So there, I've seen that elsewhere. I'm hopeful the system will have that. I, I think that it, I think that it it may, but I don't want to promise yeah. that. Yeah. Can I ask two other questions? 
compute to ask all you got. You mentioned it quickly. Uh, I'm thinking about the logistics of when they get on the bus. Will the bus driver just get a green or red light that the, the card works and they don't need to like check anything else? Or do they need to do the discount and ask if they're 18 or disabled or over 60? So um, previously, um, people would get on board, say, I'm under 18, I'm over 60, or I'm disabled. And they would have to tell that to the driver. Uh, now, uh, when they set up their account, they're just going to have to do that once. If they are doing it with us, they'll, have, they'll just tell our employee. But they're going to get a smart card that will look exactly like all the other smart cards. And uh, one of the things that I was surprised about the system is that we will actually have a regular smart card and a discount smart card. Um, so people on the discount will get a different card but we purposefully made them look exactly the same so that nobody, the driver, nobody is going to know that that rider, you know, is getting the discount. Did that answer your question? Yeah, you did. Okay. Um, and, uh, and so, but thinking about the experience, uh, you know, folks will uh, be able to come on board, they'll swipe, nobody on that bus, including the driver, will know whether that ride is being paid for by somebody else. Uh, whether they're a discount rider, whether they're a full, full price rider. Um, and, and our hope is, is that we will continue to have, um, you know, maybe not quite as fast a service because there is going to be that, you know, transaction that has to happen and there will be questions, you know, I'm sure that people will ask of the driver. Um, and there will be situations where somebody will come on board, I don't have a pass, I don't have money, I don't have you know that, and you know we're going to have to, uh, you know, figure out how we're going to handle that situation. I can tell you one of the things that, uh, you know, we're we're planning that about 10% of our riders will probably be riding without, you know, pain. And one of the reasons uh, why we're sort of okay with that is because if somebody gets on a bus and there's 20 other people on the bus and that person um, says they can't pay, says they're not gonna get off the bus, I'm not gonna stop, you know, we could say, okay, well, I'm calling the police, and, the, and they'll take 10 minutes to get out there if, if we're lucky, and all these people are now waiting. We want to avoid that. We also want to avoid the fact that, you know, if somebody, you know, we'll, we're not gonna assume that they're trying to scam us. If, if they say that they can't pay, uh, then we're going to accept that. And that's actually going to be my big challenge with our operator staff, uh, the drivers, because, you know, they like things to be very, you know, black and white, and this is going to be a, you know, a gray area. Um, and essentially one of the things that I'm going to express to them is that when people come on our buses, we get uh, money in two ways. Uh, we get money from fares, which we haven't been getting for the past few years. Um, and we get, you know, our federal allotment um, is partially based on ridership. And so that's why if somebody comes on board, doesn't give us a penny, it's in our financial benefit to still count them as a rider. And so, um, so if we're six months into this and we're finding that we have a, a large segment of the population that's figured out that we're just going to allow them to ride, we may have to adjust, but this is, you know, the way we're going to be starting. And, uh, and oh, oh, you know, I probably should have looked at this again before. I, I, that's the problem when you prepare slides in advance, then you forget the order that you did. These are just for our goals um, to simplify things. Um, and I point out the increased reliability because um, one of the things that we're eliminating is free transfers. And uh, that's why we created the $4 fare cap. Um, because we used to have, if you like took the number two in, and then you had to take the number six someplace else, you would get a little piece of paper when you would get off the bus. You would go to the driver and say, I need a transfer pass. And there would be a little printer on the fare box that they'd hit a button, the pass would come out. That was the most frequently broken component of our buses. 
And we wanted to get rid of that because we would have an entire 40 foot, you know, bus out of service because we couldn't print a transfer ticket, you know, and that's, uh, we wanted to avoid that. And the, the day cap does sort of protect uh, so that people aren't going to have to uh, uh, do that. And then, of course, our, our target. And we didn't talk too much about the opportunities for other organizations, and so I think that uh, uh, that, uh, let me focus on that. So one of the things that, uh, that I like about um, this new system, it's called GenFairLink, and uh, um, it's cloud-based. And so let's say we know we have friends from uh, the UVM Health Center, and let's say that they want to uh, create a program that helps their employees to use the bus either at a discount or for free. In the past, the way that would be handled is that we would sell the hospital uh, media. We would sell them the, the fair price, either the 10 pack or the monthly, and then they would distribute them or sell them to their you know, employees. What we're gonna have now is the ability to create a separate portal that the hospital would be able to use if they so chose to manage the people that they um, uh, are, are supporting for rides. And so that would allow them to just pay directly, that would allow them to be able to um, easily see, hey, there's the number of rides you know, that were done, so that if we wanted to have sort of a system where you know, the hospital just paid GMT you know, for rides as they came, it's, it's gonna be, you know, give us a lot more tools. And we see this as gonna be really helpful um, for service agencies like the Howard Center. Um, we think this is gonna be really helpful for large employers like the hospital. Um, and although we're not gonna be trying this with uh, the universities uh, to begin with, you know, potentially even the, the universities uh, to do that. And, uh, and my hope is, is that that is the system that will ultimately get people other than the rider paying for as much service as possible. I have a question about that. So the universities historically the student ID they get to swipe them right now as a free. Yes. Yeah. Yes. How is that gonna work in the future? Would that still be the system or that will still be the system. Yeah. Yep. It may it may change over time. Um, but the, the way it will work now is is that uh, we negotiate through CATMA. CATMA is the, the, the organization that represents um, uh, uh, the university, and uh, we negotiate with them a, a yearly flat rate. And the benefit of that is that um, then their contribution doesn't fluctuate tremendously um, the way it would if it was based on usage. And for a lot of larger organizations, what is just as critical um, as the actual cost of something is the you know, how much does it vary from quarter or year to year? And so it's just much easier for the university to say, hey, we're gonna give you $400,000 this year, and we know next year it's gonna be 410, or you know, like it, it'll just be like a steady, you know, increase. But to start, you'll show your ID, the operator will hit a little button that will then add a count to uh, UVM, um, uh, for students, and uh, and then that's how we, how we know how many folks are here. Yep. So uh, CCRC had worked with UMT and yes. Trans on a study that would evaluate a bunch of financing alternatives that would allow GMT to continue to operate fare free yes. for the foreseeable future. Yeah. Can you tell us a little about where we are with that? Is that still something you're advocating for? Well, I can tell you that uh, in the T bill this year, uh, there was uh, two studies. Uh, that uh, were uh, requested for the legislature that will be coming back. One had to deal with braided service, and braided service is uh, mostly what you'll find in rural transportation, where your fixed route provider and your paratransit provider are part of the same organization. So Adam, uh, here to pick on Adam, is with SSTA, and so in Chittenden County, uh, GMT does the fixed route and, and SSTA does the paratransit. So there's gonna be a study about that, and then there's gonna be a study about finding non-federal match. And uh, what I can tell you is, is that uh, we are gonna be, uh, when I say we, 
It's the Vermont Public Transit Association. They've been the ones designated uh, to, to come up with this. And I think that the political realities are such uh, that their recommendation um, is probably only going to generate a few million dollars a year to start because I, I think that they've looked at the political situation and that if the ask were greater, you know, it would probably be less likely to succeed. Um, and I think that the hope is to at least get um, uh, something uh, started that maybe potentially would grow over time. But knowing that the revenue that we would need to generate to replace just urban fares would be roughly $2 million a year. And I think that VPTA's goal would be for it to generate about two to $3 million a year statewide. So that, so that would not be able to cover. Uh, Do you, so how does this, this upcoming non-federal match study, how does that dif differ from the study we just did that looked at the non-federal match? Interesting because the, uh, we just looked at your study. Basically, um, VPTA hired a consultant to look at all the previous studies. So <laughs> we did that, by the way. <laughs> you know, yeah. And, and, uh, um, and so I don't know. I'm actually meeting with them Friday for our next report. And, uh, and of course, there, you know, with those studies, there's a long list of different you know, opportunities. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so it would be interesting to see which one they uh, go with. But, we have a couple of minutes left. Okay. Uh, so maybe one more question, if you have any. And then, Clayton, you're going to stay here yes. for a few more minutes? So sure. you can I'll, just I'll stay here Clayton. until the next presenter kicks me out. OK, all right. Yeah. That sounds good. Yeah. So anyone with a question? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm just curious about the, more about the transition strategy, right? Mm -hmm. Going to the new fare system and, yeah. and also going to the cards, right? From, from obviously from going fare free and going to the cards. What does that kind of education look like um, as far as is there, is there program, are there programs that you're planning to do on transit or, yes. or in other um, public spaces that, that make people really aware and make that transition as easy yeah. as possible. So one of the things that we're doing is that our system will be live in December. And, um, and that's when we would be able to start creating people's smart card or, or their, their smart accounts. Um, we're not, right now, we're not projected to get those smart cards until the third week of January. And um, what we will do is once we get the cards in place or once we are able to create, we haven't figured this out because it's still you know, a work in progress, but we will have a minimum of six weeks uh, of time where we will have events out in the community and at the transit centers um, where essentially GMT staff will be there with a the table, hopefully the winter's not too cold, and uh, we'll say, come on over. We'll, we'll show you how to set it up on your phone. And, and if you don't have a phone, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll set you up with a smart card. Uh, because what, uh, we know that it's going to take at least that time uh, to get folks ready for that day one. And uh, it's not going to be a, um, hey, fairs are starting Thursday. Good luck. You know, uh, that would just be chaos. And, and really, um, you know, we would be able to restart January 2nd um, uh, if we wanted to, but we would have to start without the smart cards, which, you know, would, would screw our most vulnerable folks. Um, and we wouldn't be able to have the, the, the correct, you know, outreach. And so that's why we're going to sort of eat the costs of the lost fares because we, to me, it's a, it's a, it's a good investment because um, the, the smoother that transition is, uh, the fewer riders will end up losing, uh, you know, over frustration with the new system. And uh, uh, so, yeah. So, so keep on the lookout. And uh, I imagine that we'll have uh, space at the U Mall. Uh, we'll probably open up our space that we have in Winooski. Uh, we used to have um, an interior space where people could wait, but there was mm -hmm. Um, behavioral issues that caused that to be closed. So we'll probably be, you know, out in the communities um, uh, quite a bit. Clayton, are you considering kind of uh, uh, translating some of this? Yes. Into yes. Excellent. And so we have, uh, we're going to be doing uh, videos in uh, multiple languages uh, that will be not only here's how to use the, uh, the passes, but here's how to use our, mm -hmm. our system. 
you know, here, here's another works as well. So Jamie, Jamie Smith, I don't know. Yeah, I know Jamie. So Jamie's all over that one. That one was we identified very early or something okay. we needed to do. Yeah. Great. Well, I think this is all the time that we have. Thank you so much. This was great. Thank you. Sorry for being kind of all over the place. I hope that you're having fun today. And, uh, uh, and always feel free to reach out to me. One of the things I love about Vermont is it's human scale. So if you want to talk to the GM of uh, the transit agency, you can just reach out directly to me and I'll be happy to help you. That's great. So, thank you. Thank you.